Hello and welcome to another episode of Greater Perspectives. We have Greg Lukianov from FIRE. He is an amazing free speech advocate, lawyer, and really an expert on the topic. And we're super excited to have you here today. When you get people talking to each other, you can go, well, really all of this boils down to not the fact that you're a horrible person or that you believe this or that. It's, it's literally, you know, you and I disagree on the basis of one or two small facts that compounded together will lead us to our radical, like radically opposite positions on the outcome. And it doesn't mean either party's wrong because both parties are actually probably right when mm -hmm. it comes to, it's just their, their basis of facts. Um, and, and when I said both parties are actually right, I'm not talking specifically about any specific case. I'm just saying, when you look at any disagreement, um, it's possible that both parties can be right if they just disagree on facts. Yeah, and and, and they're it's the John Stuart Mill, you know what I call Mill's trident, you know, and and it's on. I call it sometimes it's invincible trident because um, no one's ever defeated it, and it means three things: either you're um, wrong and you val and you benefit from freedom of speech because people can point out that you're wrong and if you yes. don't have free speech that will never they'll be fro that error will be yeah, you'll never you'll never learn if you don't have free speech that's why you get toxic corners of the internet right yeah. that they just fester because no one's ever told them they're wrong yeah um and two um you're partially right and partially wrong and free mm -hmm. speech is how you actually come to understand that and by the way that's most of life is yeah. you're partially right and partially wrong. And a lot of what you're talking about is a situation in which it's like, oh, well, you're right on some stuff and I'm right on some stuff. But we, and we, mm -hmm. sometimes we have factual disagreements or sometimes just definitional disagreements. Mm -hmm. But then in the incredibly unlikely position that you're 100% correct, you still benefit from freedom of speech because then you actually start to understand why you are right. And that's really mm -hmm. important for our flawed human brains because mm -hmm. if basically... Our parents told us something that happened to be 100% right, and we take it on uh, 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 and we believe it. We're going to hold that like we hold a prejudice or a superstition mm -hmm. because until you don't really get something until you're challenged in it and you have to explain it yourself. And if you watch the way, um, you know, people, and I, I'm left of center myself, like if you watch people on campus have to explain why, for example, they believe in affirmative action, why they support it, partially because a lot of these people have not actually meaningfully had arguments with people they disagree with. They're not very good at defending their positions. They just mm -hmm. kind of, they, they come to something much more primitive that, well, bad people disagree with it. It's like, yeah, well, well that, that's the ad hominem argument, which I think festers on social media, it's become popular, I think, even more because of social media in general. Totally. Highly confident people saying something they know almost nothing about and it just going absolutely viral because it makes people feel good is actually, for some reason, becoming the building blocks of discussion or debate now. And until I think people break away from that, we're not going to see much discussion on a lot of these topics that are that's fruitful. Yeah. And so in, in canceling in the American mind, one of the things that we spend a lot of time on, and I think it's some of the more fun chapters to read, are actually about what we call the rhetorical fortresses, like the way that we actually uh, particularly are, are taught in higher education to insulate ourselves from having to adjust the substance of our opponent's arguments. And we start by talking about what we first call the obstacle course, which are the standard sort of logical fallacies that people engage in um, when they argue. Then we go over to the minefield, which is more of the um, techniques that both left and right use to sort of just credit the speaker. But then we get to what we call on the right, the efficient rhetorical fortress. And then what we call on the, uh, on the left, the perfect rhetorical fortress. And the perfect rhetorical fortress is just layer, partially because it grew up in academia, it's just layer after layer after layer of excuse for why I don't actually need to listen to you. And of course, layer number one, and it's the same thing on the right, is just magically declaring someone as being, you know, if, if you're uh, if you're on the left, you're, oh, you're a fascist, oh, you're a right winger, oh, you're conservative, I don't have to listen to you anymore. It doesn't yeah. matter if you are, you just have to say that they are, and, and that means you're just yeah, great. It's, it, it's that it, it's the it's the implied you know outcome and meaning of that is like this is what they stand for let's just attack their character even if it's not true therefore the discussion is over and i yeah but also i wanted to also say i, I don't i hope i don't give off the impression that i'm um particularly skewed one way or another i don't describe myself as being political almost like on any political spectrum i'm kind of it's just anything about people's rights as long as we have free speech freedom of privacy you know all these kind of issues that's what's important to me I don't know if you've um, kind of seen what's happened in, in the past 
um, in my background, particularly with parlor and everything that's happened there, I get the presumptive assumption that I'm somehow right leaning because I was building a platform that believed in free speech. Mm -hmm. Therefore, everything I say must be bad. Right. Yeah. And so I personally very much understand the, the implied action of that, um, of, of, of like w what you just described. Yeah. And, and, and meanwhile, kind of like, it's also the way a child would argue, essentially you're, mm -hmm. you're a baddie and therefore people should listen to baddies. And, it, and it's, it's not, it's unworthy of intelligent people, but, but higher ed and K through 12 do actually teach people to argue this way. And that's just stage one of the perfect rhetorical fortress. One of the more fun parts um, in that chapter is just taking people down what we call the demographic filter to be kind of like, mm -hmm. well, people, you know, sometimes on social media get dismissed for being white or for uh, mm -hmm. being straight or for being not uh, being cisgendered. Mm -hmm. um, and we work it out that essentially by the time you get down to the bottom of the demographic funnel, you've been able to eliminate maybe 99.1% of the entire population of the, mm -hmm. of the country and an even larger percentage of, of, of the rest of the world. Um, and, but here's the funny thing. The very next step is, and by the way, none of that actually mattered. Um, th they mm -hmm. just got you down to, you know, less than 1% of the population. But if you are a non-white uh, transgender person and you have a wrong opinion, then you're especially evil. Then you have internalized mm -hmm. transphobia. You have an internalized <laughs> misogyny. Yeah. You have internalized mm -hmm. racism. All of these mm -hmm. things that are there, and we call them perfect. It's like, mm, wow, there's there's literally no way around this. Like, yeah. And, well, and 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 by the way, I I don't want to give off the impression that it's just a left leaning thing because people on the right boil people down to communism and communism. Oh, sure. Oh, I really like that I have a you know government health care plan. Well, everything you said is wrong now because you're a communist because you're a socialist and you know whatever. Yeah. So and, and when we talk uh, about the official rhetorical fortress, fortress, that's what we're talking about. It's like magically yeah. declaring someone left wing and also kind of letting yourself off the hook to listen to journalists or other kinds of experts, and particularly on the mm -hmm. sort of MAGA right. We've definitely seen a lot of people that, you know, if you disagree with Trump, then I don't have to listen to you anymore. Yeah, if you don't if you don't share my views on him, then therefore uh, everything you say is evil. And the nice thing about those arguments that you're describing, this rhetorical fortress, kind of th the nice thing is it's super easy to justify with about anything. Yeah. <laughs> so it's not a difficult way to justify your argument, and I think that's why it's so popular. Yeah, well, it, and it's it's a lazy way to argue that we should never have taken seriously in the first place, but eventually we can stop taking it seriously at all, and we should because we. And the thing that we stress a lot is it will never get you to truth. It will actually actively waste your time and never get you to truth. Yeah, it puts the person on defense instantly. So now they got to defend themselves against a completely irrelevant uh, allegation that has nothing to do with the substance of the argument. It's already lost. The whole thing is lost. When it um, when it comes to free speech, not just in person, um, it comes to online free speech. Do you do you at Fire since you've kind of branched out beyond your work at universities? Do you guys also talk about what's going on online in in the kind of online culture wars of censorship? Absolutely. Um, and one of the things that where I was kind of embarrassed for my fellow First Amendment lawyers was there's a case called um, that uh, was is now called Murthy, but it was well, once called Missouri v. Biden. Um, in which the question was whether or not there was any limit to how much the government can um, browbeat social media mm -hmm. companies to engage in censorship that the government itself would be forbidden from engaging in under the First mm -hmm. Amendment. Yeah, and I think the sensible answer is, of course, there would have to be like you you, you mm -hmm. can't have you can't have the government leaning on private actors to do their dirty work for them. That's a big yeah. major problem. And when mm -hmm. this decision came down, now to be fair, at the district court level, it was a messy opinion, the, the way it came down. It was probably too broad. Um, but you ended up having people who were otherwise supposed to be First Amendment defenders saying, well, this really limits the free speech right of the government to pressure social media companies to engage in censorship. It I don't just think that I don't think freedom of speech. I mean, I could be completely stepping in a pile of um, dog dirt right now by saying this, but mm -hmm. I don't think the government has free speech rights compared to that of the citizens. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 the, there's debate about whether or not um, like the government is entitled to some viewpoint. There's the debate on what that actually means. But do they have free speech rights to pressure um, groups to be, you know, censors mm -hmm. in their stead? Yeah. No. And uh, and of course, you got to do some line drawing. And, and when it got to the um, appellate court, like is a uh, is the CIA? 
you know, telling Twitter. It's like, by the way, we're actually seeing a big uptick in, in uh, you know, mm -hmm. um, actual terrorist uh, terrorist coordination mm -hmm. using your website. Fine, you can absolutely tell them that. Um, yeah. And by the way, I can I can tell you from firsthand experience, they do do that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but, but if you, uh, but if what you're saying is kind of like, well, you know, like these guys, we, we want people to take the vaccines and there are people questioning the, the safety of the vaccines. You better go, uh, kick them off your, uh, your, your website or else you'll be in some kind of trouble or, or imply that you'll be in some kind of trouble. Yeah. You don't, you don't need to imply, or sorry, you don't need to even say a consequence when yeah. the FBI or the government, anybody from a government agency calls and says, Hey, would you look into this? Yeah, you know that the expectation is look into this or you're going to be in a congressional hearing, look into this or, you know, we're going to investigate you for something irrelevant. It's the, the threat doesn't need to be say, said because it's automatically applied the minute they contact you. And the Mur the Murthy case, you know, like it's going in front of the Supreme Court and, you know, mm -hmm. fire uh, really believes that we can get some clarity, you know, finally on is, you know, what's called euphemistically government jawboning, um, if that's mm -hmm. OK. Um, and we think. It's not. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, that's it, it's definitely not okay. And you can see that social media has become a lot of the actions of being overly cautious to the point where conversations are heavily monitored, curated, and censored, especially when it comes to their quote unquote algorithms, you know, for you. It's it's all very heavily curated and censored and monitored because I think a lot of it has to do with this implied government risk. Yeah. No, agreed. And and I think the, um, you know, I, I feel like I've seen some improvement on Twitter, on what used to be known as Twitter, uh, you know, over, mm -hmm. over the past couple of years, not, not that it's perfect or anything, yeah. but certainly, you know, uh, other, uh, j just the utter hostility directed at X, um, even just for yeah. initially mentioning the idea that it was going to be friendlier to freedom of speech. Yeah, I, I'm very sympathetic with the fact that I think X gets a lot of um, they they have a lot of battles of just bad publicity because they claimed to want to defend free speech. And that's scary. I think everybody universally should have supported them for that. No, granted, agreed. granted, I don't think X is a free speech platform by any means, but mm -hmm. at least saying it should be something that the world supports. And that was something that was really, um, uh, I wouldn't say exactly say shocking to me was that even saying it was, was, mm -hmm. was greeted with such, horror um yeah and it's like well okay the, the the forces that we've been fighting on campuses are everywhere now um and mm -hmm. people raise just assuming you know at, at the way i've put it is that free speech is the argument of the bully um the bigot and the and, and the robber baron and always having mm -hmm. to explain you know i know that you've been taught that this is free speech is the bad guy's argument but mm -hmm. explaining that if the bully and the bigot have 51% of the vote in a democracy, um, they can silence the other 51% unless you have a First Amendment or freedom of speech. You yeah. only need freedom of speech to protect minority viewpoints. And when mm -hmm. it comes to the robber baron, you know, like the, the wealthy and powerful historically have done just fine because they're wealthy and powerful. Yeah. Yeah. D democracy and, and also, or not. <laughs> yeah. It, it, yeah. <laughs> well, it's also worth mentioning too, or saying that, Free speech is there to protect minority groups, and many minority groups are uh, worthy of fighting for, and many of them are, well, probably not. And that's everyone's own opinion and just, you know, ability to make that discussion. If you don't like something someone's saying, the answer is not censorship, it's more speech. At least that's how I've always seen it. Yeah. Well, and, and that's believing in, you know, human freedom. <laughs> the, the, yeah. the, the other alternative, which has uh, always been. The, the the tension or the bad guy in this argument mm -hmm. is the idea that no no power should make these decisions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's also like you know what I'm just gonna screw my head off, and stick it in a jar over there. They can make decisions for me, and that's just that's I don't know. It's totally contrarian with what I would be accepting. Yeah, and that's you know I think that there's I, I've written about this um, uh, in, in other places just about the. You know, um, people will, growing up, people would say truisms, you know, like since the dawn of time, man has longed to be free. And it's kind of like, mm -hmm. well, okay, let's, let's clarify a couple things here. One, they've had to long to be free because there were some other human beings repressing them and oppressing mm -hmm. them. 
-hmm. the other is uh, there were probably people who were kind of like, ooh, you know, I'd rather have someone else make my decisions for me. Um, mm -hmm. And so freedom is fragile. And, you know, and if you take away speech, you're taking away the weight, like um, every other right that comes out of that. You know, when we talked earlier, we spoke about the idea that um, there's this like hidden government implied pressure to censor at least online for social media companies. Wouldn't you, I mean, in theory, right. Doesn't that make sense that that also is probably what hit during the McCarthy eras um, as well as like this implied pressure that the government isn't a fan of communism. Therefore yeah. it's popular. Therefore get rid of these professors. Yeah. Well, Wouldn't part of what, it, part of what uh -huh. happened uh, um, under the McCarthyism and I wish kind of people would, I, I am a first amendment person with a strong um uh upbringing in history like, like basically i wanted to get a phd in history after i got my my, my um uh, uh, my con law degree mm -hmm. and i i think that sometimes we sort of pat ourselves on the back by not taking previous historical moments very seriously and mm -hmm. i've been writing a series on my substack and my substack's called the eternally radical idea where we kind of compare cancel culture to other incidents in american history but really, you got to put yourself into the shoes of the people who are around at the time. And after World War II, you know, we became aware of the fact that American citizens and British citizens actually helped give someone who had, you know, arguably murdered more people than even Hitler the bomb. And people freaked out because it actually turned out there were spies in the United States. Um, this is all mm -hmm. like a, a, a lot of the stuff is extremely well established now. And yeah, and I think that you probably, you, you the uh, theoretically, you would be pretty freaked out under those circumstances too. Meanwhile, we're not in a national security crisis since 2014. We're not in a situation mm -hmm. where suddenly, you know, we, we think that uh, it's not justified under the idea that these are people who are helping, you know, give Super Hitler the bomb. Um, mm -hmm. And we're still seeing more people getting canceled over smaller and smaller slides. Yeah, it's terrifying. I, I also am of the belief, though, that it's still not excusable, no matter how much you're in fear. Oh, sure. Thing to to jeopardize your morality and your entire basis of your country. And I think COVID was a good example of that when we could see that a lot of people were really happy to give up their freedoms to feel safe. And then, you know, the people they were giving their freedoms to were wishy-washy and unclear of what the actual answer was week after week. And so if they would have stuck to their underlying principles, I think – uh, of respecting people's rights and freedoms, I think we would have been better off. But that's speculative, and who knows if that's true. But I would oh yeah, and and, and to be to, to be clear, like well, what I'm saying is, it doesn't mean that there, nothing bad happened during McCarthyism. I absolutely think yeah. a lot of innocent people really really suffered under it. But it makes it, but understanding the historical era in which things happened help us understand the how weird the president uh, president oh, is yeah, even more. For sure. Mm -hmm. That leads us into an election year, although I'll, I'll have to say I think this one is not one that um, a majority of Americans are really kind of happy with their choices for. Um, but all of these kind of attack strategies to bury the other person in debate and discourse, that seems to be pre prevalent and it's going to continue to be prevalent this year. You know, do you have any thoughts on what's coming up? Yeah, I think things are, I think it's going to be a rough year. Um, I think no matter how the election goes, I think it's going to be a rough, ugly year. And I think cancel culture will probably get worse. I think the situation on campus is going to get worse. Um, it's an unstable geopolitical moment um, mm -hmm. as well. And I think that the likelihood of things um, just ending in, in, in Gaza without some additional flare up happening somewhere in the world is low. So yeah. I think I think we're uh, I think it's time to buckle up because I, I think things are going to get kind of ugly. Meanwhile, of course, I get people saying, well, Mr. First Amendment guy, um, this is and I get this both from the right and the left. Mm -hmm. This is this is all stakes. This is really serious. And at times mm -hmm. like this, we can't afford your First Amendment. And it's like, no, mm -hmm. no, no. In times of like serious, like w w at times, particularly when when the, the political sides are at each other's throats, the rules mm -hmm. of the game become more, more important, important yeah. not less important. So yeah, more people are going to hate fire um, and more people are going to need fire. <laughs> yeah. Well, people will need it. Uh, the one thing that I, that it came to mind when you said, well, this is the most important one ever. And uh, I, I realized at least for me, it seems like that's kind of funny because we've seen both of these now candidates have been president before. 
So actually, I think we can I think we can safely say um, neither one has completely destroyed the country as we know it, and we're all still alive. So um, maybe it's not the most important uh, ever the world has ever seen. It's maybe we can tone that down. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I unfortunately um, made the mistake of reading The Fourth Turning by uh, mm-hmm. by, by Neil Howe, um, and I went into it. it assuming uh, there was a book called The Fourth Turning is Coming um, by mm-hmm. Neil Howe, and, and uh, his last name is Strauss, but he, he passed away uh, since then in 1997 uh, that I thought was going to be you know, some kind of seventh seal kind of mystical read on history about historical cycles. And then I read it and I was kind of like, and it was predicting, you know, a, a, a big, um, a, a big, I don't want to say calamity, but like something revolutionary, like right around now, more or less. Um, mm. And something kind of big beginning around 2008, you know, um, and it got so many things right uh, that mm. it was kind of creepy. And it was based on sort of um it was based on th- theories of historical cycles going back to the ancient Romans and based on pretty sound ideas, like essentially parenting strategies tend to change and they follow, you know, somewhat predictable format that you have protection of kids, which is normal over protection of kids, hyper over protection of kids, and then neglect. Um, mm-hmm. And that you have, you know, spiritual cycles that tend to repeat uh, major client, uh, major, um, catastrophe sort of cycles that repeat on an 80 to 100 year basis and you made a strong argument for we're you know like we might be overdue for some for a big a big change and nobody knows what that's actually going to look like so i'm i'm Mm -hmm. uh, i'm 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 uh, i'm a little nervous going into this uh, going into the next couple of years yeah i'm i'm nervous too because i think that the most important thing that we could really do right now is have somebody who wants to take the conversation from like up here and bring it down a little bit like let's turn the burner down a bit and bring the country to a point where we can talk to each other again and um and that i think for me would be my number one most important issue and i don't see a candidate out there who's capable of that and i also unfortunately don't see a social media landscape that's incentivizing any of it and so much of our politics today is driven by social media. Um, so it, 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 did you happen to remember where that parenting cycle is, by the way? Because that seemed interesting to me. I don't know. What what did it say about the parenting cycles? Well, one of the things that, that I thought was it w- was fascinating is that it nailed Gen X as being the children of neglect. Um, and it was like, yep, yeah, pretty much. And, and it would kind of like focus, um, think of ourselves as tough and resilient for all these, you know, not necessarily positive mm-hmm. reasons. And then we and our slightly older, you know, boomers um, tend to therefore be overprotective. Um, mm-hmm. Now, I have a six and an eight year old. My instincts are overprotection. I have to be mm-hmm. reminded, you know, to um, uh, by my wife of, of my own book, Coddling the American Mind, to make sure that yeah. I, I keep my own anxiety under check and I don't hobble the kids. Um, and I, and I, do, I do try to live that. But I always try to be clear. I don't find that easy. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're definitely in an overprotected stage. I, actually, sorry, hyper overprotected stage when it comes okay. to um, gender. And what comes gender. after hyper overprotection? Usually, hyper over the, the hyper overprotected. Um, uh, it, it, it goes back to just sort of like normal protected. Uh, so basically, mm-hmm. they talk about like the, the the five different types are the um, the hero archetype, um, the um, uh, the the lost sort of like the wilderness archetype, uh, the spiritual archetype, sorry, hero archetype, spiritual archetype. Um, and there's another one, but then the, the fourth one is the, um, sort of like lost in the lost archetype and Mm -hmm. the boomers are essentially the spiritual archetype. Like they're the people who thought that they were saving all of humanity by being so great. Um, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I could be a little hard on the boomers. It, it def- oh, I mean, I, it's easy to go hard on the boomers because that that shows maybe the reason that they come across as being the ones that are so great is because they're the ones that are out on the internet yelling in all caps and oh. who fervently have the answer to every question 100%. I remember what uh, you're a millennial, right? Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, so so the, the millennial archetype is the artist archetype. Um, the artist yeah and and so uh and it, it it tracks pretty well over the historical cycles we're familiar with like shockingly well particularly in the united uh in the united states so i, I do recommend this book to people it's going to be my book of the month probably next month next month sweet what was that again 
Um, it's called The Fourth Turning is Here by, by Neil Howe. And he's he's a serious uh, de- demographic ex- historian. Um, he, he grounds it very much in um, broad de- demographic trends uh, and also in, uh, in historical cycle theory going back millennia. Huh. Well, that's cool. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know. I'd be curious to read it to find out if I'm even really on that spectrum of uh, relevance because I feel like I'm always the exception to every rule. Yeah. Um, in this case, I don't know that I would consider myself, I definitely wouldn't consider myself overprotective of my daughter. Yeah. I would consider myself protective naturally, but um, I try to understand that with some, you want to have some mistakes made so that she can learn, if you, yeah. you know, and so um, I, and I'm trying to think of my parents are probably also the exception because I don't think they were overprotective at all. I'm pretty yeah. sure it would be the opposite. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I mean, like, it, it's kind of funny. Like I, I was glad that, that there's new, a new documentary of Codling in the American mind that came out that I was heavily mm-hmm. involved in. Um, and I am glad I got to get the line out, you know, um, and they kept it in the movie, which is like, listen, I don't recommend my childhood to anyone rather than just me, uh, you know, two, two Gen Xers, me and John Haidt um, arguing that we're teaching young people the mental habits of anxious and depressed people. It's um, uh, it, it's overwhelmingly like minority students themselves saying, yeah, no, I was a pretty happy person. And then I get to college and they tell me that everyone's against me and that basically like if people say things that hurt my feelings, I'm going to be permanently damaged by them. And it got it made me paranoid. It made me sad. It made me feel powerless. Um, and yeah, it absolutely devastated my mental health. Um, so I'm, I'm really proud of how it came out. Um, it's on Substack in part because, you know, a lot of the platforms um, were too scared of it. Um, mm-hmm. And so, yeah, I, I really recommend it. I'm very proud of how uh, of the final product. I think it's a very compassionate film. Is there anything that we should uh, that we should know about from your perspective? Is there anything else that we should cover? Oh, yeah. I mean, the, the, the expansion of fire, you know, like the fact that fire um, is really... I think de- deserving um, and becoming, you know, the nation's premier defender of freedom of speech is something that I would really want your readers to know about because we need your help. We, and we need people who aren't the free speech for me, but not for the type, the ones who are kind of yeah. like, you know what, if someone thinks something I hate, they have every mm-hmm. right to that as just as much as I do. And by the way, it's actually probably pretty useful for me to know that what they actually think yeah. rather than taking it, you know, on the basis of the, the, what the New York Times tells me this person actually thinks. So, yeah. you know, we would love more, uh, your support at FIRE. We'd love you to check out Coddling the American Mind and, of course, Canceling the American Mind, my, my book with Ricky Schlott. Yeah. And it's more important now than ever that we that people are taking the topic of free speech and real free speech seriously. It's being used so much, I think, today. Um, to justify different political agendas. Freedom of speech is something everybody should universally respect and enjoy. It's kind of the foundation of our country. And, you know, Greg Lukanoff and the team of FIRE, I think, are an excellent um, place that we can focus our energy on to ensure that, you know, we're protecting free speech for the most people where it matters.